Thank you all for joining us today for a discussion with the sciences libraries on how we're helping advance student success in the sciences. Also, we do have an option for closed captioning that you can see in the bottom menu options to your right. And if you'd like to receive closed captioning for this event, you can turn it on there. I'm Rika Ogala, Director of the UCLA Louise M. Darling Biomedical Library and Science and Engineering Library. You'll hear from a number of library colleagues today, Ibrahim Ali, Courtney Hoffner, Renee Romero, Kian Rafai, and Doug Worsham about the work we're doing. We'll be focusing on what we are currently doing and how we're planning to improve and modernize our facilities to help build on services and expand on impactful partnerships and provide a hub of learning and research for our students. After our presentation, there will be time for guests to have an opportunity to participate during a question and answer period via Zoom's Q&A function, which you can also find located in the bottom portion of your screen. Not all of our presenters will be able to stay on with us for the entire time. So uh, the Q&A portion may not have everyone that is presenting, but will cover the breadth of topics that we're discussing today. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, space changes that we're implementing at the Science and Engineering Bolter Library. We'll also be talking about the collaborative learning commons and partnerships that we've been working on with other campus entities in that space. Then we'll continue on to the Writing, Instruction, and Research Education Program, or WIRE. I'll be welcoming you and showing you where we're headed with the physical spaces at SEL and Bolter Hall. So let's take a little bit of a trip um, back to our physical spaces for a moment. So this is what our science and engineering library in Bolter Hall looked like at about 2006. You uh, may remember back uh, having visited those spaces. Um, the reference desk and a wall of books greeted you as you came into our world. The library has always been a place where containers of knowledge and people intersect to advance discovery and learning. A few years ago, we incorporated the reference collection into the stacks and consolidated service desks. We saw student enrollment on campus climbing and the library anticipated needing more space to support student research and study needs. This is what the library looks like today. Well, not exactly today. In case uh, pictures like this make you a little nervous, seeing so many people gathered in one space together, please know that these images were taken in a different time um, prior to the current health crisis. But today, during a typical quarter, the SEL reading room and the collaborative learning commons are packed with students seeking space in between classes to continue their learning. In fact, Students needing, uh, needing spaces and services to support uh, learning and research needs has led to some really interesting library collaborations. And the lower right hand corner is an example of such a collaboration happening in our collaborative learning commons where students are working together with their materials to help untangle their learning and research questions. Do you notice how the main reading room picture evokes that feeling of serious, hunkered down nature of studying with which we're so familiar in the sciences? We also may be familiar with how science learning is done. We consult with our colleagues and we learn together. The library helps facilitate that deep learning through services, spaces, and collections. We are the heart of research and education at the university and the connective bonds between students and their academic success. Of some of the programs that we offer in this space and partnerships, we're gonna be focusing on two today. Courtney, Ibrahim, and Renee will be talking about the partnerships with the Center for Education Innovation and Learning in the Sciences, or as we like to call it, SEALs for short. That partnership leverages existing library spaces and aims to improve the retention of students from underrepresented groups in science, technology, engineering, and medicine majors. This partnership was born out of librarians working to understand the learning needs of students in the sciences. In that work, a need surfaced that we could help meet. 
we had a large open space, formerly staff cubicles, that we had filled with furniture cobbled together from other renovation projects. SEALs and another tutoring organization, Peers, needed space where they could move furniture and use smaller active learning groups to help students in classes that are the gateways to success in science majors. It's been an exciting partnership that my colleagues will be expanding upon. Finally, Doug, Kian, and Renee will discuss the library's WIRE program. The WIRE program has partnered with SEALs Learning Assistance to develop open educational resources and center learner voices in STEM. This program has been producing content for education and providing student developers with skills they can leverage post-graduation. And it's really a wonderful and exciting program that I can't wait for you to hear about. We're going to be discussing all of these exciting programs, but before I hand it off to my colleagues, I want to show you where we're hoping to head tomorrow. So we've talked about the SEL Bolter that we remember back in the day, and we've talked about what it looks like now. In our next phase for SEL Bolter, we're looking forward to advancing student success by creating a variety of refreshed spaces throughout the library. The variety of spaces match the preferred study and research habits of our students. You may notice different furniture than you might expect for a library. We know that our students study in so many different ways. Some want a study buddy nearby, but want to be alone at the same time, studying alone, but together. Some want the quiet, low hum of activity. Others want to get up and draw out that problem on a whiteboard together. And some want a truly quiet space. The idea is to both maintain the reflective, peaceful tradition of a library, while also accommodating the reality of how people learn together and grow. While these images are artistic renderings, I hope the previous slide's photos convey the more realistic pattern of use of library spaces. We anticipate being packed to the gills again soon when we can all return to normal. And until we're fully back to normal, in whatever capacity we open, we'll be working to provide safe, healthy, collaborative space for our students to learn and grow together. So at this point, let me pass the baton on to Ibrahim, Courtney, and Renee, who are going to talk to us about one activity in the collaborative learning commons. Ibrahim? Thank you, Rika. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ibrahim Ali. Um, I am the sciences data librarian based primarily in the biomedical library. However, I work on a number of projects uh, throughout the sciences libraries and especially in the science and engineering library, SEL Bolter. So for me, um, I really view the library as a space where we can fill uh, gaps in the current academic structure. Um, and one example of this um, that I think of is that when a student is entering into a rigorous academic setting like UCLA, it can be challenging. Classes are often at an accelerated pace and use a very formalized and academic form of English that often uses complicated jargon and may be unlike the way that you and I speak on the day to day. Whether it is first generation students who don't regularly speak English at home or students coming from one of the many underserved schools across the nation, it can be a very difficult adjustment. Uh, it can be jarring to enter a setting where faculty assume the most from our students when they come from such varied backgrounds and use such formalized methods of teaching. And so using and creating versatile spaces like the ones that we are trying to create in the library are crucial to filling these um, important academic gaps. And so uh, along those lines, the library fills this critical gap um, of learning um, by uh, providing access to resources, providing research support, and much more. We like to say that the library serves to provide both collections and connections. And among these important connections includes the Center for Education, Innovation, and Learning in the Sciences, SEALS, which Rag had just mentioned, the Peers Program, the Undergraduate Writing Center, you might hear more about this later, um, each of which provide various types of support to students. These partnerships were made possible through the reimagining and revitalization of our spaces, and we envision new possibilities as we seek the resources to further reimagine and revitalize the space in SEL Bolter. I will now pass it to Renee, who will tell us more about the SEALS Learning Assistant Program. Hello, everyone. 
My name is Renee Romero, and I'm the librarian for several engineering departments and a course on interversal dynamics. And I'm based in the Science and Engineering Library in Balter. I'm really happy to be here today with you to talk about our partnerships. So one of our most impactful partnerships has been that with the Center for Education, Innovation, and Learning in the Sciences, also um, which might be referred to as SEALs throughout the presentation. We have a great partnership with their Learning System program, which largely serves underrepresented student groups in higher education by helping to address the various barriers to success that underrepresented student groups face, some of which Ibrahim just mentioned, which might be not having English as a first language, for example. So the Learning Assistant Program helps to address these barriers to success through peer-to-peer -peer sessions where students help other students learn. The program primarily focuses on promoting student success in science, technology, engineering, and math courses on campus that many students sometimes struggle with. These courses can include subjects such as physics, computer science, chemistry, biology, and more. But what is a learning assistant? So learning assistants are students who have previously taken a challenging course and been successful in that course. They are then trained in teaching methods and learn how to use active learning strategies to help current students of a course more deeply understand the topics they're covering in class. Learning assistants work closely with faculty, TAs, and other students and participate in class sessions, as well as design learning activities and hold learning sessions outside of the classroom. So as an example, a learning assistant partnered with a physics faculty member might attend the discussion session with students and be able to ask clarifying questions about topics they know students may struggle with. They then also hold sessions outside of the classroom to further discuss some of these physics topics that may have come up in class. And these learning sessions outside of the classroom are truly one of the main reasons for the success of the program as they allow for students to learn from other students by having discussions about difficult concepts, work through activities together, and build a community where they can ask questions and collaboratively find the answers. Space renovations have allowed us to specifically collaborate with the SILS Learning Assistant Program by providing a variety of spaces that the learning assistants need for their learning sessions. Prior to using library spaces starting in fall 2017, learning assistants did not have a dedicated space to hold these learning sessions, and they often held them in places like the campus dining spaces or outside on benches or lawns. As we saw in the packed photos earlier, those spaces are not conducive to the size of learning groups, nor the different types of learning that are happening. Thankfully, we were able to offer these modernized library spaces and students were able to meet in the same place weekly, have more space for their student sessions, and it also encouraged a lot of really other cool things, such as open study as well as scheduled and drop-in sessions. It also allows for a variety of learning sessions and styles, whether that session be focused on a discussion or something that needs a whiteboard or a screen. These interventions for underrepresented student populations are crucial, especially when supporting success in STEM fields. A 2015 report from Dr. Sylvia Hurtado and Dr. Victoria Sork, two UCLA professors working with support from SEALs, documented that UCLA students from underrepresented groups have a STEM graduation rate that is 30% less than non-underrepresented student groups. By providing the Learning Assistant Program with renovated versatile spaces, we're helping to increase the success of programs that directly impact the future of our more vulnerable students. The personal connections and active learning that takes place in the space allows for increased relationship building, meaningful learning activities, and that greater sense of support and stability that these students need to succeed. I'm gonna pass it back to Ibrahim to talk a little bit more about that impact. Thank you, Renee. Uh, one way uh, that illustrates to us the impact of these spaces is, uh, is chatting with the uh, teaching assistants themselves. And we have some quotes from uh, a teaching assistant that has worked closely with us, Ali Munj. Uh, uh, in their quote, they say, the CLC space provides consistency and familiarity for students taking multiple courses throughout their time at UCLA. This familiarity promotes a level of comfort that allows students to embrace peer learning and teaching. Comfort in learning spaces is very important for really accomplishing learning. Um, and to support this, um, we have another quote, the library staff has always been very accommodating and respectful, especially when there are a greater influx of students than expected. Often, uh, the spaces get filled by these uh, large groups of students and it's comforting to see that um, the library staff have been able to support uh, participants in these student groups um, to uh, ensure that they can get the learning that they need done. I'm going to pass it to Courtney now to tell us a little bit more about the uh, data in, um, in support of 
this illustration of impact? Yeah, so um, as you've said, another way that we um, demonstrate this impact of both the value and visibility of the library and also of these programs is through our hard stats, right? So in our first year, the fall 2017 um, through uh, spring 2018, we had over 12,000 students who visited the STEM CLC to attend a workshop or office hours. 86% of these students who attended these workshops agreed or strongly agreed that they helped them learn the material. Um, in addition, the Science and Engin Engineering Library itself saw a 17% increase in the overall use of the space for all purposes. Um, so that was both the, the SEL Research Commons and um, the rest of the library as well. So we saw an increase in usage of space overall. Um, and then when the Undergraduate Writing Center came in, there um, it was a highly successful program and there was a 92% fill rate of appointments in those first two quarters of its implementation. And then um, in the next year, so many other spaces on campus were inspired by our space that we saw other departments adopt the same model. And as a result, um, the LA program increased overall on campus by 30 to 50%. So in addition to talking about stats, um, we also wanted to tell a little bit about our personal experience with the space. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my office is located in the same building as the CLC, um, or Collaborative Learning Commons, and so I would see it quite often when I was going into work and we were back on campus. And one of the aspects that has been really inspiring and stood out to me is just how needed the space is. So whenever I would walk into the room, students were always working together to solve problems, whether that be with heads bent over a worksheet or speaking excitedly with other students. And for the past few quarters, before I moved to a virtual environment, there would often actually not even be enough space in the collaborative learning commons to sustain all of the students during midterms, and they would overflow into our classroom spaces um, as the main reading room didn't have the kind of versatile seating that students needed to optimize their learning. So we did eventually move to reserving the classroom on midterm weeks so that we knew we'd have enough space for all of the students. But as Courtney mentioned, in the first year of the partnership, Learning assistants had approximately 12,000 student visits in the CLC, and that number has only continued to grow. So this has allowed us to think about new ways to reach students and expand on the partnerships with the Learning Assistant Program to work toward our shared goal of creating an inclusive hub of excellence and collaboration for students. And that brings me to the next phase of our partnership with the Learning Assistant Program. So in the library, we really saw the impact of the work the Learning Assistants were doing. And we started to think about the relationships between their work, library goals, and a program in the library called WIRE, which is a learner-led design team that creates online learning resources. So while we know the word synergy is often overused, that really is the best word to describe this partnership. You see, the LAs are bringing extensive experience helping students in small groups on key challenges in STEM, and WIRE is bringing a process and an approach to creating scalable online learning resources that can be used by thousands of students. So with the two programs together, we see the opportunity to empower learners to help each other both synchronously through small group work and asynchronously through online learning resources. We want to talk with you a little bit more about the WIRE team and why we're so excited about the potential for this partnership. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Keon, who's going to talk about that a little bit more. Hi all, my name is Keon Ravaya. I'm a fourth year undergraduate in the class of 22. And um, I'm an instructional design assistant for WIRE, and I have been for the last two and a half years. Um, WIRE is a learner-led design team of undergraduate and graduate student employees hosted by the library. And our job is to create open educational resources. Some of these include animated videos, handouts, interactive tutorials, and lots more. We integrate these into courses across campus, and we've integrated them in departments like Scandinavian studies, English, uh, the cluster programs. And our learner designers come from a variety of different disciplines and backgrounds. So everybody's bringing a unique perspective to this team. We'll talk a little bit more about the learner-led design aspect of it, which is very central to our work. So I'm going to pass it on to Doug. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Worsham, and I'm a science librarian at UCLA. And along with Renee, I'm one of the co-founders of WIRE, and along with Courtney, uh, one of the co-creators of the concepts behind the STEM CLC. Um, we're really excited to share with you today some of the values and principles that guide our work at WIRE together. 
Um, at Wire, we place learner insights and experiences right at the center of our design process because we know that learners have key insights on the top challenges and the most important breakthrough moments in their education. Uh, we've seen that when we empower undergraduate and graduate students to create video tutorials and interactive multimedia based on these insights, we can really make a difference on campus by fostering inclusive excellence and building pathways to success for all learners. Uh, so we'll be get a, get a chance to kind of look at some of these values in practice over the next several slides, and Renee's going to get us started with that. Yes, I'm really excited to talk about this. So as Doug mentioned, in WIRE, we try to create materials that reflect our values, and we really wanted to share these examples with you. So one of our values is to celebrate our diverse communities, and we've really tried to intentionally do that in the materials that we're creating. It's led to materials that intentionally center the narratives of a variety of students from underrepresented groups. So these are, again, potentially first-generation students or minority populations on campus. So one such example, which is on the screen, is our getting started with research at UCLA video. And this was made in partnership with the undergraduate research centers on campus. In this video, undergraduate students talk about their experience with research, from not knowing what research means to completing intensive research projects. At the end of the video, we direct students to resources that they can access on campus in an effort to lessen anxiety about how to get started. We're really trying to recognize the importance of students seeing students who look like them excelling in academia. And we're excited to promote a more inclusive culture at UCLA. Just as a personal aside, uh, I went to UCLA for both undergrad and grad school. And I know that I would have been so excited to see a resource like this, as it was often hard to find role models who I related to in a more personal way. This kind of also ties back to the wire addressing hidden challenges that may not be apparent, as it isn't always obvious that seeing someone who looks like you succeed can help make you feel like you can do it too. Um, so to talk about further examples, I'm going to pass it over to Kate. So we've found that when learners lead the design of instructional materials, it significantly increases their relevance as well. Wire's work is rooted in learner-centered design, which allows us to create materials that are memorable, transformative, and relevant for students. This is an example of Wire's YouTube playlist called Reading Strategies that features seven students talking to other students about their academic reading strategies and providing helpful tips from their own personal reading habits. These strategies range from turning headings into questions as you read to my personal favorite, taking three deep breaths before jumping back into reading. Learner designers experience the challenges of succeeding in academic institutions firsthand and for that reason, they can design materials that directly address these challenges in ways that they know will be relevant and compelling for their fellow students. Back to you, Doug. Thanks, Kian. Uh, Renee mentioned earlier the hidden challenges in, um, in education. And at WIRE, we found that there are so many of these hidden challenges which are really relevant to success. Sometimes the most important breakthroughs for a student aren't covered in a lecture or on the syllabus. Um, as we talked to students and faculty about this, one topic that kept coming up was communication practices. Students told us that it was really difficult to know what to say or how to ask a question in emails to faculty or how to have effective office hour conversations. Um, faculty and TAs told us that students needed to improve their email etiquette and be more specific with their questions and communication. And they wanted students to come to office hours more prepared. So it was one of these situations where everybody was frustrated, but nobody was talking to each other about it. It wasn't a topic that often made it into a lecture or onto a syllabus. So when WIRE took this on, we compiled student and faculty challenges related to communication, and we created this two-page handout. On one side, which you can see on the screen, there are tips uh, for emailing faculty, and on the other side is a list of tips for preparing for office hours. Uh, this handout was a huge success on social media with students and faculty all over the country sharing it with each other and talking about it. And I think it really showed the value of directly addressing hidden challenges uh, in our work and in the curriculum. So, in the same vein, we want to make sure that the path to getting an A on a project is really clear for everyone in a class. In this project, CREATES, we took a research proven approach to reading scientific articles, and we partnered with Professor Jordan Moberg Parker, UCLA's Director of Undergraduate Laboratory Curriculum and Assessment in Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Genetics, to create detailed annotations 
of excellent student work, such as this flow map on the screen. We built a whole website around this idea in order to make the pathways to success much more transparent for all. Another success factor for WIRE has been exploring new media. So as you've seen, we create a variety of different things, including videos, interactive tutorials, websites, and handouts. This is a recently published tutorial on breaking down academic articles in which we combine an interactive multimedia slideshow with the classic and relatable format of the comic book. It is an amazing example of mixed media experimentation that we're hoping to build on with a whole series. And we expect these will be very popular and effective. We just completed another tutorial in comic book format on annotating bibliographies. So we're often asked, um, you know, you make all of these things, uh, how, are, how are they used? So next we'd like to share a little bit more about impact. Uh, Keon already mentioned that we have integration of WIRES resources into classes across UCLA. Um, that spans um, all disciplines across campus. And we also have uh, WIRE resources being used everywhere from introductory freshman courses to senior level capstone classes as well. Uh, we are deeply committed to creating open educational materials, which means that everything we make with WIRE is available both at UCLA and to learners and teachers around the world. I uh, got a chance to look at the website statistics this morning, and I found that WIRE resources have been accessed from 172 different countries, uh, which I think is a pretty amazing achievement for a site that's about research and writing tutorials. Um, every year, we've seen our impact go up, both at UCLA and uh, around the world, through open access. Uh, we're honored to have been recognized with the 2018 ARL Film Festival Award for Best Reflection of Diversity, and we also currently have seven five-star editor reviews for Merlot.org, which is a website where faculty and educators from around the world peer review open educational resources. Um, also, very thrilled to be able to share that as our uh, alums graduate and go out into the world, they continue to have a big impact. WIRE alums have gone to work in education, in industry, in technology, and they often tell us how their experiences with WIRE were essential to interviewing and landing a job. A couple of WIRE alums got in touch with me recently to tell me that they use their design and technology skills all the time in their new jobs. And I think this is another key aspect of the value of this work and another reason why we're really excited about the next steps and our partnerships with SEALS and the Learning Assistant Program. With the shared goals and vision between WIRE and the LA program, it was clear to us that our partnership had a lot of room to keep on growing. So starting in the fall, we'll be working more with learning assistant students to begin creating tutorials and online media for the students that they are serving. We're really excited to add virtual spaces to our partnership in addition to our physical spaces. And by continuing to strengthen the partnerships that we have grown, we know together we can make a brighter future for our students. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Rekha who will moderate our Q&A section. Thank you all so much for sharing all of your different um, programs and experiences with students, staff and faculty in the science and engineering library spaces and in the library spaces at large. I'm really excited to see how the sciences libraries are impacting the learning of UCLA community and beyond. So we have one question in the chat um, from Louise about a home URL for wire resources. Um, I think that uh, might be something somebody can uh, please add to the, the chat portion. While everybody's uh, digesting what they've just heard and thinking up um, great uh, questions, I have one that I'd like to get started with. Um, Renee, you sort of left us with a little bit of a teaser. Um, and so to the whole WIRE cohort, uh, where are some of the directions that you're hoping to go in the fall in partnering with SEALs and WIRE? Doug, maybe you and I can both answer this question. Um, so partnering in the fall, we're hoping to move toward creating more intentional resources that are specifically addressing challenges in specific STEM courses. As we mentioned, the Learning Assistant Program partners with different faculty. And so we're really hoping that the interventions that WIRE is addressing 
and these hidden challenges that students are facing are going to be more specific toward these STEM disciplines and could be something a little bit more niche than something that we're usually addressing, which are often foundational concepts that every student can potentially apply to their studies. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Renee. Doug, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think that that's perfect. You know, we're really excited about the work we've done so far with SEALs and, and uh, working with the students there and just excited to expand on that approach. Um, take the kind of um, experience and insight that Keon has been giving to research and writing and bring that into STEM education as well. Great, thank you. I see we have two questions in the Q&A portion. The first one I'll, I'll take on, it's from uh, Robert Baker who asks, are you adding UVC lamps for safety in the libraries? And thank you so much. I know there have been so many advances in types of technology and furniture that we should be implementing as we re consider returning to campus. We're gonna take all of the precautions that campus uh, asks us to as well as that LA Department of Public Health recommends as we consider how we're going to start opening spaces when that's allowed. Um, and at that point, we'll be also looking at all of the different types of technology like UVC lamps or whatever is the best thing at that time to incorporate in those spaces. So while I don't have an answer or an order in for those types of lamps just yet, um, we are um, concerned about the health and safety of everybody at UCLA and especially in our spaces. So thank you for prompting with that one. Another uh, question from Louise is, are other UCLA library disciplines uh, going to follow this model, especially college, undergraduate, and liberal arts programs? Um, Doug, would you like to talk about how WIRE expands in other parts of the libraries as well? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, we're definitely partnering with um, all of the different libraries, as well as with multiple campus partners, the writing programs, the undergraduate research centers, uh, SEALs, as we mentioned. Um, so we do see um, library staff at each of the different libraries working with faculty in their subject areas to integrate these resources into the curriculum. Uh, we have, um, I think I've got a list here. Yeah, I do. So um, we've uh, seen integration in so many different classes, but um, the general education cluster program was one that we mentioned, ecology and evolutionary biology, advanced microbiology, the writing two requirement, which is a large scale endeavor on campus. It's one of the required writing courses. We see WIRE uh, integrated into many of those courses, history courses, society and genetics courses. So we see a lot of integration across disciplines and that's thanks to our amazing colleagues in the library who are working every day with faculty to talk about teaching and learning and do both uh, uh, synchronous, like we're doing today, instruction, as well as online instruction through through WIRE. And Jim Shidaishi has also a question related to how we get such great volunteer students to participate. And I want to make sure that I say that our students who participate in WIRE and the learning assistants who participate in the SEALS program or the Peers LA program are paid for their work. It's, it is a service that we're very excited to offer um, in terms of both professional development for them, but we recognize their labor is valued to the library. And so we dedicate a portion of the library student budget to make sure that the WIRE students are, are paid. Now, Doug, I know you and Renee have both been working on hiring uh, students for a while and making an excellent process for recruiting creative uh, students who are ready to learn. Are there any tips that you wanted to share or uh, anecdotes about that experience for the group? Or Keon, from your perspective as a student who is hired into this? The job listing for WIRE says curious about design and that immediately grabbed my attention and it grabbed a lot of my colleagues attentions as well. Um, and I, well, when it comes to the nitty gritty of the hiring process, I think uh, Doug and Renee have developed a really great way of um, having student recruiting students, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I can start and then hand it off to you, Renee, if you like. Um, so our uh, recruiting process is uh, something we're really proud of. It's unusual in that 
Um, the student learner designers do a lot of multimedia work, but we have no requirements or expectations that they come in with technology experience already. Instead, we say, if you're passionate about helping others and make a difference, we'd love for you to join the team. And then on the job, we'll mentor you, we'll help you learn the technology skills that you need. Uh, and I think that that makes a big difference in terms of an inclusive recruitment process. And it's led to a very diverse team over the years in terms of, uh, in every way, from uh, students from different majors, different backgrounds have all been part of WIRE. I don't really have anything to add to that. I think what I was going to pinpoint was the same thing, but it really is finding people who are really passionate about the work. It does in some aspects have a learning curve, but we don't mind that. We think that learning is part of life. And so it's just finding something that you're passionate about um, that really, I think, brings in amazing students like Keon. Thank you. I have to say, I have been so impressed by the students that have been recruited into this program and how they're able to bring their backgrounds into the experience of creating a tutorial um, that really speaks to a larger audience. I think Louise uh, Ratliff commented that relying on the points of view of experience of student volunteers is incredibly valuable since they're coping with all of these issues. And, and she met student assistants and I completely agree. Thank you for, for um, bringing that forward, Louise, and I think that's also what we were sharing during the presentation. Paolo Dutra, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, um, asks, um, are these services offered through the entire opening hours of the library? Um, so the wire services are online and are open 24-7, 365. Um, the SEAL services, Ibrahim, would you like to talk about sort of the, the amount of time or the planning in terms of how we coordinate with TAs to provide those services? It's a, a great question. I actually don't have the exact hours of um, the SEAL services, but, we, but um, the SEALs program coordinates very closely with our access services staff to provide um, uh, these hours for both uh, at the time when we were open in person um, hours and um, now um, virtual hours. Um, and, um, and so these are all generally um, during uh, what I would call business hours. Um, so, uh, you know, after nine and before 5 p.m. Um, I will, uh, uh, I'm not entirely sure if there are after hour um, uh, appointments also available. Um, and so I might pitch that question to Renee, but I know that um, the uh, learning assistant program um, are very accommodating to the students who come in. And there's a lot of opportunities, not only for drop-in, but also for scheduling appointments um, uh, to, uh, to get help with, um, with the, uh, the things that they uh, provide. Yeah, that was perfect. I would just add on that the, the Commons learning space is truly a versatile space in that um, after the scheduled appointments are done for learning assistants, the space is still open for them to come in and talk and work together, um, whether that's just with learning assistants or with other peers that they're working with on a project. Thank you. So Jonathan Marcel asks, how many library assistants does the library employ? Um, I, it could, I think you could also be, I could also interpret this as learning assistants. And I wanna make sure that I emphasize that SEALs are our partners. And so the learning assistants are hired through SEALs. Um, and I don't have the exact numbers on those right now. Um, I, I know it started out small and started to grow exponentially over the last few years as more spaces have been made available to them and students have um, come to seek those services out more for SEALs. For the library, that would be a huge number across the whole library. Um, for these programs within WIRE, and uh, it um, varies uh, over the years, I would say. We've had as small as two and as many as seven at one time, Doug, I think. Um, and uh, it's the, the number of students we have directly affects the amount of products we can turn out in any one year, but the quality has just been excellent regardless of the number of students we have. So it's really been um, an exciting thing to see. I think we're making it through the questions for the most part. Um, I did want to leave a uh, a few spaces in case um, people would like. Oh, and um, I heard from a colleague that the the learning assistance program within SEALs uh, 
um, went from 90 students, 90 learning assistants in one quarter to 238 um, quarter over quarter or per quarter um, to provide those services. And so you can imagine the number of people coming in and out and having a dedicated space that they know they can go to to be able to do this kind of active learning without people being uh, feeling that they're disrupted uh, is really a, a unique feature that the library can provide. Um, I have a, a quick follow-up point uh, relating to Louise's question from the beginning, um, are other UCLA library disciplines going to follow this model? Um, and one of the things that um, I have been really working on in, uh, in terms of the, the data sciences program at UCLA is that um, the sciences libraries are trying to work very closely with the data sciences center, which is primarily based in the young research library or the research library spaces. And one of the critical issues that we are constantly running into is that there isn't a very good space for the data program to meet in the sciences. And in many cases, the sciences use computation and data um, in a way that's much more heavy um, in, than, um, than some of the, the social sciences um, disciplines. And so, and, and so the Data Sciences Center is trying to engage more with what we call South Campus. And so one of the things that I really think about as we try to revitalize our spaces and reimagine what kinds of programs can grow, I really see that um, revitalizing spaces like the Sciences and en Engineering Library really allows us to build partnerships that are growing in other disciplines so that we can really bridge these gaps that exist. Um, and, and really at the end of the day, um, when it comes to data programs, a lot of these similar skill, these skills are translatable across disciplines. And so, um, so whenever, yeah, like I said, whenever I think of revitalizing the spaces, I also think about these programs that are looking to expand in our spaces that um, are having uh, difficulty doing so because of the limitations that we currently have. So we're looking forward to renovated spaces in the science and engineering libraries at Boulder Hall when we come back to campus. Um, we're really grateful for you coming to this session. And while we'll be happy to stay on and answer more questions, uh, we wanted to thank you uh, all for attending and for listening so closely and adding wonderful questions to the chat. We find it such a privilege to be able to share with you the work that we're doing at UCLA Sciences Libraries. And we're very, very glad that you came to uh, hear us. If you have any questions, uh, follow up for any of the the presenters, or you'd like to figure out how you can partner with us to help make this a reality, please um, do make sure to contact Library Development. Their uh, email is and phone number is on the screen here, giving at library.ucla.edu. Um, they'd be happy to put you in touch with any of us who uh, spoke today, and I'm always happy to answer any questions that you have about the Sciences Libraries. Thank you so much for joining us on this brief tour of how we're helping students success in the sciences.